I think we are required to start, which is okay-ish. So um, first things first, welcome to the Yacht Above. With me is Mr. Philip Ballister, also known as the Minister of Progress for Open Embedded. My name is Joseph, some of you might know me. I do developer relations for Mender and community management, also for the Yacht project, and I am Usually, the guy with that hat running around and doing stupid things. One of these stupid things is that uh, I like audience participation and I'm very strong about traditions. So, I have some things with me. Chocolates, which I will throw at everybody who interacts with us at every, every point in time. If you don't like sugar so, too much, but actually honor my um, tradition of drinking during the Yacht Buff, which is highly encouraged by me, not officially, but me personally, um, uh, Come on over and have a beer. They're here for handing out. Whoever feels like, just show up. I've got a bunch of Mender stickers around here. They're nice and shiny and glittery. Drop by, and with that, let's go. We don't have a clicker, which makes us look super um, unprofessional. <sighs> yeah? We, we've been doing this for a real long time, and not only in buffs. So we hope, we hope to be good stewards of um, the Open Embedded and Yocto project. Cheers. Cheers, enjoy. And feel free to hit us up at any point in time if you ever want to talk about some of these things or other things, you know where to find us. As some of you have might noticed, it's 2 p.m. right now, which is not the original schedule which we had. Um, we were asked to reschedule and we were like, okay, that means that we are able to actually attend the party tonight. And as we all like parties, and so do you, we said like, let's talk a little bit earlier. We can also have a drink at 2 p.m. and then we are all good for tonight. A little bit of organization and praise. The Octo Project welcomes some new members. Members are what keep this thing alive. They make us, uh, they enable us to keep the operations and everything that comes with the Octo project and all of this stuff up. So thank you. First, Garmin. Um, not, no, okay. Not are they only um, uh, a member on the platinum level, which enables us to do a, a lot of stuff. Also, Joshua Watt specifically has been a really long-term contributor for a lot of convoluted stuff that, that nobody other than him dares to touch. So, thanks Garmin for contributing like this. <laughs> Next one is Boeing. And in that case, um, it's Quite similar, not that much code in the Yocto project, but a lot of work in the security ecosystem. And to that avail, specifically, let me welcome Mr. Chuck Wolber here, our representative for that stuff, and the Boeing, the guy who made this possible. Other than that, we also welcome Peridio and Ambition on the silver level, and a little bit of politics here. Actually, it is possible to join us without us having you tell. So, there might or might not be other members that help the Yocto project grow. Let's thank those in one big round so they can enjoy it even though you don't know. We've got some cool stuff prepared tomorrow. Uh, the Linux Plumbers Conference starts. Uh, Mr. Minister of Progress. Okay, uh, so we're having a Build Systems Microconference tomorrow at Plumbers in the afternoon. Um, On-site attendance is full, but you can get a virtual ticket for $50, which will allow you to remotely participate. Please remotely participate from the hallway and take pictures of each other view outside of the room. Um, and I want to make it very, very clear, I just, may not be important to the people in this room, but the intent here is for us to be build system neutral and to try to learn from other build systems what we can do better and share knowledge across build systems, because many of us are solving the same problems and struggling with them, and that's what we want to do there. So we want to share knowledge. Concerning sharing knowledge, the uh, next Yocto Project Summit is coming up virtually, so you don't have to go to flooded uh, cities anymore by whatever means of transportation. Uh, the CFP will open hopefully real soon, actually once I get ready to do it. Um, 
Everybody of you feel personally oppressed by me to submit and join, okay? It's, it's that simple. I told you, you do what I say. Also, open embedded, it's the people's side of all this technology stuff. Um, so, first of all, you can join the open embedded organization by reading the membership page, and it'll basically tell you to send us a short bio so that we can have the members vote you in knowing something about you. Uh, once again, we are planning to have a workshop um, probably the day after FOSDEM, and we can't announce it because we haven't heard when FOSDEM is, so I can't try to find a room. But please be thinking about content to present there, uh, because it'll be the usual short runway for planning once we hear when FOSDEM is. We will make progress on this too. Um, some other housekeeping, just to make sure you have heard, heard it in an official way. Yes, GothCap is out. It's the current LTS for four years, maintained until uh, 28. Starhead is coming up real soon, hopefully. Two fancy features that I went into this, unpack your support, because we've got a lot of clutter of source going around. That's very technical. If you are interested in that stuff, read the mailing list. I actually don't understand it. I trust Richard that it's cool. And the other one, I already mentioned it. Garmin, um, Joshua was like cranking away on SPDX three support, basically the day it was, it was ratified. It's already in there. We're one of the first projects that actually can produce SPDX3 compliant SBOMs. So yeah, please take it, build your SBOMs, and then smash your toolchain because they're so huge that no tool can actually read them. <laughs> With that, um, basically you can interrupt us at any time. And we'll take basically every question but there are a couple of recurring questions for many, many years, and we have taken the liberty to answer those in advance. The one is, yes, we are old school neckbeards and we have the kernel style workflow. I know that some of you have other interests, but please spare us the 15 minute rant that will emerge out of this again if somebody asks us for GitHub in this room right now. You can buy me a drink tonight and we, we, you can enjoy the rent privately and intensely, but we've had it here. And uh, I pointed out that at uh, Plumbers there's a talk about not fearing GitLab or something like that, and that's about using GitLab for the kernel workflow, which is the other big email patch project. The, and the other FAQ is, what about RISC-V? As usual, throw money. That's the story. Technically, it's done. Open Embedded can be uh, built for RISC-V, 32 and 64 bits. It, it runs on QAMO, blah, 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 yada, 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 yada. There is no official support there. Why is there no official support? Because nobody with pockets that are deep enough is actually saying, yes, we want that. If you care about RISC-V in the Octo project, throw money. At risk five basically works. What happens is it's not on the auto builder test matrix. Exactly. So if it breaks, someone might not notice for a while. And it's not no official. One dedicated to fix it. It's not official. That's the story. Okay. I already did enough stupid things. How about you? Walt. That that is, that is highly accurate. But actually, there are responsible people in this room. I'm not looking at anybody here <laughs> who makes sure that I'm not doing something as stupid as making pink slides for a buff. <laughs> okay, serious questions. <laughs> Chocolate, of course, of course. Oh, that's why you did this. I've gotten pretty good at aiming. Yeah, I've, I've got years of practice. The hope of uh, not asking something that's been clarified before, but what is the status on Meta Java? It's been quite <laughs> outdated, and I've had a bit of a look around it. I've tried to make a newer version of it. Um, wow. And uh, to maybe ask a second question that you might also hate me for it, I've used the, I've enhanced the, uh, what is it called, host jobs of the tools that you can use. Uh, basically to get around the problem of needing to bootstrap and needing a lot of other layers. 
if I come somewhere in a good direction in that, is that something that might be interesting? Or is it something where they just say, you just use the Java from your build machine, uh, it's not going to work, it's not going to be accepted? Does somebody from the audience want to respond or, or want me to? Uh, does anyone want to respond to these? <laughs> <laughs> and that was why use Java. <laughs> So I, I brought this up in the AGL. I think it was a BOF as well. Um, I mean, the obvious solution here is expand what we mean by host tools. Uh, and it, there's the other one, um, I keep forgetting the name, but it's like Scala or something like that, where it's matured to the point where you actually can't use GCC to compile the next version. You have to use Scala to compile Scala. So to me, that we, we could, as a community, say, um, oh, well, use a container or whatever, or we could potentially recognize that some, some programming languages are mature enough that they can bootstrap themselves now, which is a basic reason to think that either we say, I'm going to take an 18-step process to build Scala, or I'm going to just say, if, if, it's, if it can bootstrap itself, then that's a candidate to be a host tool. And is Java one of those? I don't know. I don't follow Java that much. I don't know, but I know that if we you know, that could be one potential solution for it. Ross, Ross, over there. Yeah, there you go. Chuck one chocolate? Oh. No chocolate for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, instead of host tools, I would kind of prefer if, even if we did have a meta Java that worked and built its own Java runtimes, it bootstrapped using binary recipes. So you could grab the, uh, the AWS rebuilds and use those as a base, instead of relying on host tools, because they can be fragile. Ross, duck. Close. <laughs> Just this little bit. <laughs> You've got very beautiful glasses. Where did you get those? <laughs> so, so I actually know that uh, Tim Orling, he was uh, trying to uh, do something with the binary uh, to bootstrap uh, like uh, uh, recipes, uh, but he ran into issues that uh, master would not even uh, compile, uh, wouldn't even get there at the moment. So uh, we, he, for, he, he would first need to fix basically the... Uh, I don't know exactly what recipes are failing right now, uh, but he couldn't even get master to really run uh, before he, he, he ran into the, the issue of, of tackling how to compile uh, Java itself. I tried to spare you. <laughs> uh, so I maintained Meta Java for a few years, uh, handed over to Tim. Um, the problem is basically manpower. We, we were two guys running Java 7 and 8 and kept that alive, but had no real usage for or need for, for new Java versions. And the real problem is the bootstrapping process of Java. It takes lots of effort to get really the Yakta project open embedded way to bootstrap it from source. So if you're interested, have some time, can convince your employer to spend a full-time job on it, it would be great. <laughs> and if you have a question, just sort of wave at me, even while someone is speaking. In a nutshell, it's the same problem put your money where your mouth is. If your product relies on Java working in that context, put, put money into it. So I'm working uh, <clears throat> with a system B startup in Yocto. So I'm wondering if there's anyone else that's kind of lacking some best practices on how to make that work in a, um, let's say, uh, a way that doesn't uh, suck. <laughs> Uh, today, there's like uh, you have like six or seven ways to actually start a service through Yocto uh, no. or through SystemD. No. And uh, as a big, big company, big platform, we're building out like 200 different products, different use cases, and people in in the team don't know how to how, how do how should I start a service or my service. Everybody thinks that their service is important. Yeah, everybody thinks that their service is special, but I, yeah. Um, 
chocolate for you. I actually would say that there is exactly one way in Yocta to start a system D service, which uh, is declaring the system D unit and uh, either or, uh, auto enable it or not. And everything else is um, doing something that system D supports. But then please go talk to the system D people because they give you six or seven or whatever best practices ways. Uh, this is one of the cases where I feel that Yocto has, or Open Embedded, has actually done a pretty good job on deciding on one variable set that you, that you put things into and then stuff runs. Um, so I, I see the problem with, not, not the problem, I see the challenge with system D. But I think in a Yocto context, this is, uh, this is a solved problem. Yeah. Everybody feel free to disagree. That's cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that's okay. Leonard is, uh, I, Leonard is a nice guy. I, I have no, I have no grudge against him. What is actually the issue? Is the job definition, or is just like every every job is enabled, and then at runtimes there are conflicts, or like what is? Yeah, because I agree, like the, the, the job definition itself is something that is just his peer system D, right? Uh, and then of course, like you can have, but then there's practices on job definitions as well, right? If, if you're conflicting with, you know, like each other, then you know, like you need to also, you know, set the dependencies correctly and all of that and so on. But from the Octo, basically, is, is a matter of like selecting a build time, what should be enabled or disabled, right? To the image itself, right? So the image can be always reproducible from that perspective, but yeah. A typical challenge would be that some, some uh, device want this service started as fast as possible, boot time, mm. and some other doesn't want it started until someone presses a button or something. Mm. So that's a typical stuff that you run into, and then you need to override this per product and stuff. It gets kind of messy. Yeah, we are Yocto, we are build time. Whatever happens at runtime, <laughs> talk, to, talk to somebody else, please. <laughs> Just one advice for me, don't put them in a systemd recipe. Use systemd machine units for that. Otherwise, the build time blows up. If you can put we... all your units into systemd recipe, don't do that. No, 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 no. Yeah. Can, can, we, can we get a presentation submission of you? I've, from, from you on this topic at the Yocto Project Summit in December, tell people what not to do. <laughs> Thank you, Slava. Yeah. Actually, Slava is one of our long-term speakers, and he also will be at the Yocto Project Develop Day Thursday. It is Thursday. If you want to enjoy more wisdom of this fantastic guy, see you in two days. Did, it sounds like you need more like modal behavior rather than that. Like if you have a service, you've done a good job decoupling it, but you need modal behavior depending on the build. You can use targets for that. I, I've done that. You use targets for it, and whatever target you assign, whatever the default target is, for example, and magic happens that way. <laughs> Two votes. Yeah, so targets is one of the things I was going to comment on, but the other one is, and I use this quite a bit in AGL, is systemd override fragments. So basically you can have a recipe, and then if you have an image for a different product model where you want different behavior, you just have that recipe installed, like that one comp file to override something. And it's not perfect because the syntax for that can be a bit strange at times where you have to like clear a variable and reset it, which isn't ideal for, uh, you know, trying to maintain things. But the other thing is there are some weird things that sometimes about trying to use environment variables inside the systemd uh, unit files. You can't use it for the actual binary name is one of the things I would have liked to see work. Um, but uh, between those things, like you can either, you know, suck in an environment file and then use it for options or, you know, just in the override, reset some things. And so that gives you a bit more flexibility. And we now have some stuff in AGL where I have like two or three versions of our demo images and I use that quite a bit actually. So it helps some. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> we need okay. more practice. Okay, we have more questions. Otherwise, I will ask you things. I have some backup so questions. You, you keep asking because if you don't ask, I will do stupid things. Yes. <laughs> I'm uh, working on upgrading to ScarCap, and one of the things I stumbled upon was that uh, since Miglador, we don't install recommendation in the classical SDK anymore. 
And the, that hampers us a bit because we have like our normal uh, workflow is we have application team where we deliver an SDK so they can do their stuff. And I usually use a dummy package with the same in dependence. And then I get a SDK with all the dependencies and hand over to those guys so they can start getting their things working. Right now, I'm missing all the dependencies, but they usually come in the recommendation. So, and we have the two ESDK now and the classical SDK. So also what is the direction with the SDK style? Good question. Does somebody know? <laughs> well. Yeah, maybe. So you're building an SDK. Uh, the if, SDKs are normally based on the image contents. So if the image has everything in that it should have, then it should work. So I'm not sure what's breaking there. Well, I'm not aware of anything that actively broke between, well, Mikkel does quite old now, but then and now. I don't think we broke the recommends. I don't hope we did. It's terrifying if we didn't. Um, Yeah, that's the only thing I was thinking of. If you've accidentally got no install, no? No, if you disable that variable, so no matter what you set, you push no one, right? You're like a half one. You make a five. So is it a bug or is it a feature? Yeah. Let's call it a feature. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom of the crowd. Who, Do you want who, to grab who? me afterwards? Oh, that's, uh, I think I'll submit maybe a patch. Change. Yes. Send patches. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Do you want chocolate? <coughs> yes, please. Oh, <laughs> Hello. Uh, I've once heard, like one or two years ago, that someone is working on a layer management tool, like integrated into Yocto. Is that? Is there an update on that, or, or if that is a, not a good question, what is nowadays? Can, 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 can I give the political correct answer? Um, I hey. wish Alexander was here to talk about this. Let, let me just give the politically okay. correct answer, okay? Okay. Thank you. So, this was funded by the Sovereign Tech Fund, and we thank them heartfully for it. The outcome of this effort has been pushed to the Open Embedded Architectural List, I think, in the last couple of weeks. Alexander Canavan has been the implementer on this. So, there is something currently which might evolve into the recommended go-to solution for Yocto. As the main integrator developer is not in this room at the moment, I would ask to ask him directly or on the mailing list. If you are so inclined, I will introduce you. Um, Robert, so you know that I can't throw this distance. <laughs> There's something in Master Next yeah, and I've seen some discussion. Has anyone in this room tried out what Alexander has done? Russ. Can you speak to it at all? All right. All right, so there's someone up in the corner. <laughs> Who up here was waving? Maybe. So yes, there is layer setup stuff in flight, uh, patches, and testing welcome. Vienna joke, better in flight than, than in train. <laughs> yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, it's not a Yocto question per se, but uh, what kind of CI does uh, Meta OE currently have? Come again, sorry. Uh -huh. uh, the Meta OE is basically build tested as a best available situation. It's not as rigorous as what's in open embedded core because at that point the testing matrix would explode. Um, once again, all of this is related to how many people we have to fix bugs as they show. So you can test all you want, but if you can't get the bugs fixed, there's sort of no point testing. So are there any test results or let's speak afterwards? Um, I, so, there, are there any public test results? I would have to look and see what there is. Um, 
Yeah, we should look afterwards. But it basically is just a test matrix size. Martin, in the front, or Chuck? Oh. I'll go to Martin next, yeah. I need the exercise. <laughs> Uh, I have a completely different question or idea, something in between. Um, imagine the case you have an image that is in production state, so all debugging tools are out of the image and it's like somehow knocked down, uh, locked, locked down. And then, then there's a problem at the customer side and you have to add debugging tools to that image afterwards. But it's a monolithic image with an AB update or something like that and it's not package based. Um, the idea is um, like producing an overlay with Bitbake that can be added on top to the original image afterwards, like a container layer, say maybe several, um, to add debugging tools, to add development tools, whatever, to, to an image, to have this uh, release image on the bottom um, exactly the same, maybe even out of the same build. Is that an interesting idea? Does anybody else has these requirements? Somebody working on it? Turn, turn around, turn around. <laughs> I'm going to go here first. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, so what people usually do is that they keep one include file with the base software and then they produce several images. Test image, project image, develop image. That's usual practice. Yeah, but basically what you're talking about is creating an overlay that's a delta to a base image. Yes, at runtime. No, no, you're not creating it at runtime, but you're applying it at runtime. Yes, yes, we've, I've done that. Uh, I Did it hurt? I posted detailed instructions on the, I think it was the OE core mailing list. You can search for it. Um, we did it for SSH. So we needed a way to create an image, but not an entire root FS image. So did a lot of unholy, probably I uncomfortably like embarrassing things to create <laughs> actual image recipe that only drops just the precise, narrowly defined things we need. I'm sure I broke a lot of rules, but I posted the instructions on, on the list. I never got any replies, but I figured maybe somebody else would want to use it. So. Community yeah. manager hat here on, and I'm going to cite my, my, my mentor. Can we have this, this on the wiki, please? <laughs> <laughs> You, you will get another drink for it, okay? So, someone posted patches to OE Core in the spring where I believe there was a class for it. But what the trick was, was it, uh, it basically used the package database to say, build this new image and all these packages are already there. And so it basically make an image that already has those dependencies assumed. Um, and I don't think that went anywhere, but uh, there were patches on the mailing list like earlier this year with a way to do it. You two um, please enter a relationship. Well, it was not for me though, there was some, somebody else. And I, I'm interested in this. So I, I've also done the thing before for container stuff where I've built, you know, dummy images basically that fake it. Um, and so I've discussed this with Ross a couple of years ago at, at, uh, in Dublin as well. And there are other ways you can imagine doing this. Like we could probably have it that when you built an image, it made a package group that said, you know, that sort of like, you know, covers all the, the packages that are in an image so that you could say, this stuff is already there when I build a new image. So there's things that can be done in, you know, upstream. It's just so far, no one's actually like coded up a way that's got merged. So yeah. I think, I think there's room for this kind of stuff because, um, you know, system uh, D now has the system extension concept and for hot patching and stuff like that, it seems pretty good actually as a, a scheme because it, it'll do it all for you at boot time. So I think we're in a position now where these kinds of things are becoming a lot more interesting. So we need to probably come up with a, a good way to do them. Hmm. John? So uh, just just highlighting, so uh, later today, there's a session about debug info D. So if you are not bound to pristine image or can accept a little overhead in the file system, you can link up with debug info D for the debugging purposes. That's another option. So there is no single way to skin that card. Yeah, that, I think it's at like 655 or so by Etienne, right? 
Feel free to check this out. This is a Yocto heavy afternoon in the schedule. <laughs> we, we, we have somebody re really athletic in the front row who volunteered to take over your, your job. I, I'm just saying. Yeah, so, hi. Uh, this is not exactly related to Yocto, but uh, it's something that we use through Yocto. So I just wanted to ask around if there is a better practice to do it. So we are using ScanCode as one of the tools to generate the package information. And as we all know, scan code is also still deficient in certain aspects, right? It's not that they extract the completely right information from the packages, so not even the right copyright text in some cases. So has anyone got a better experience with some other tool? And is there any plan to like integrate it in Yocto as well? I mean, there's, there's Jan. And is, is Conrad also around? Conrad? Not today. So those are the people you should talk to. Maybe maybe pass the mic to. Join the next talk right here. She's a current executive. See, just, you just yeah. So stick, I mean, stick just, to your seat. just stay stay tuned. The next I'm going to do the next talk, and I'll cover exactly that topic on what can be done, and then what are the gaps, and which tools can support, and which Yocto layers are there that can support. Awesome. Problem solved. Next. <laughs> <laughs> What arguments can I use in my job so we can switch from build root to Yocto? <laughs> uh, I, I, I hear that there are companies who are really competent and will sell their hours for you to have an easier life. I, I just uh, uh, learned about Yocto this year and I think the reason is because one the manager itself has a, a lot more experience in build root, but what I see is Yocto uh, as an alternative is a very more um, fulfilled in terms of features and uh, what you can do with it. But I, I'm, I'm not sure if I get the, the question. Is the question... It's like wh the, what I need to, to... like the arguments I can use to try to change from build root to Yocto. Okay, first thing I really want to point out we do not hate build root or such. If build root fits your bill for your project, then please use build root. This is important. We are not saying that we are superior or we are the only ones who know to do things. What we say is use the tool that's best for the job. If build root fits, fits your bill, use build root. If Yocto fits your bill, use Yocto. Where the one thing that I will point out is Yocto really shines when it comes to full reproducibility. I think Michael already mentioned it in the morning. Build root just runs off and does a lot of stuff into the directory. It is super fast. But if you want to modify something or remove something, then it has no clue about it. So Yocto basically think of it as a declarative way to build a Linux distribution. If it is not reproducible from the static information in the recipes, then Yocto has no notion about it. And then it, you're basically in trouble deep. This is the, the biggest source of all the power and all the complications and all the features. Um, if you want a rundown comparison, this is probably beyond what this buff offers. Um, but I would, I would really say at the heart of it is the reproducibility because that enables you to do all those fancy features like package feeds, like SBOMs, like SPDX, like blah, 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 blah. If you need those things, Look into Yocto. If you just need a root file system quick right now, use build root. Uh, I, st I still owe you chocolate. Oh, Martin also got one, yeah? Huh? We, we still have five minutes. So, so over the past... Shut up, I'm aiming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not that bad. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now you can talk. Yeah, so similar to kernel, I have seen that over the past few years, U-Boot has started accepting the fragment model. So we have the base dev config, and on top of that, you can have a dot config file, which you apply. But to my knowledge, I have not seen 
uh, Oikor, you boot recipe, adopting that. So is there a way? Yes. <laughs> See? I, I actually am not sure, but if somebody else who is competent claims that there is. So it's, it's exactly the same way as you would create the fragment for the kernel configuration. So whatever bit bake, la la, menu config, you make your modification and then you do a bit bake diff config, you get the fragment out of that and you throw it into your uh, U-boot recipe, that's all. Are you talking? So in U boot you have two you have two uh, configurations. The one is the one used by U boot, and the other one is what's passed on. I mean, the, the U boot configuration itself is what you're talking about. You want to add or remove a feature of U boot. Yeah, that's it. It's exactly the same as you would do it with the kernel. With the kernel, you create the fragment, you add the fragment to your source URI. Same thing with U boot. Yeah, then you have to change the path of your source you right to point there. Yeah, of course. So Sounds clear as much? Probably. Possibly. Your hands. So how, how, we, we have like three minutes left. Yeah. Should, should, should I send you all off with some, some, some um, chocolate or fancy feelings? Let, let me ask you. Who of you is doing Yocto for a living? Show of hands. Uh, Yocto, yeah, or Yocto related work. Okay, basically everybody, or close to everybody. Who of you is working for a company or in a context then that call themselves uh, a software company? Uh, who of you is considering themselves part of a company that calls themselves a hardware company or a hardware vendor? Who of you? That, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Now, you are allowed to put down your hand if you do not sell board com uh, computers that I can purchase as a single person. Okay? Who of, who of you produces proper BSPs? <laughs> <laughs> I actually agree that Nishan does a good stuff. <laughs> yeah, but ser seriously, Megan just um, pointed it out. PSPs are a recurring topic, especially as hardware vendors usually do a pretty awful job in maintaining them. I mean, I'm no saint there either with the, with the vendor stuff that I have uh, on my plate, but a lot of things are just like either not on LTSs or on randomly chosen versions that only work on uh, specific repo hashes or whatever. So again, me as the guy who gets the rants later, if you produce BSPs and if you hand them out to people, please try to make them non-bloated and maintained. It's, it's just two simple things. Don't bloat them and maintain them. Thank you very much. It makes my life so much easier. We have one minute and two chocolates. Show of hands. Okay. <laughs> no idea where that end up. Last words, Mr. Ballister. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time. <laughs>